Hello and welcome to the Vinyl Sideways Podcast, diving deep into a discography, one side at a time. I'm Jerry and with me is Al. We're just a couple of dopes who like to listen to records and talk about them. We continue this time with Side B of Pink Floyd's third album, the soundtrack to the film More. And uh, Side B is interesting. I was looking over it just now as we we took a break between recording episodes here, and uh, I didn't realize it at first, but I'm realizing it now. Uh, All of the songs on Side B, they're all instrumentals except for one. I did not realize that myself. I knew that there were a lot of instrumentals on this album, but I never really intellectualized that they were mostly instrumentals on side B. I yeah, it's a, it's that. a in in the sequence of uh the tracks on the album, they've they've backloaded with uh instrumentals. So, we'll talk through those. Um and the first one is um the main theme that is the name of the track, main theme. It main is theme. The main, main theme. Very creative title. It uh, is the main theme of the opening credit sequence to the film as our uh, main character is uh, standing along the side of a rainy, wet road trying to hitchhike his way to Paris. Um, it really works, in my opinion, as uh, an opening credit sequence theme. Uh, it's an instrumental. Uh, we start off with uh, Roger and uh, his his gong, his favorite. Um, I, I think he loves it more than any kind of bass or guitar playing that he did. I think he loved playing the gong more than anything else. At least it, it appears. I think so. as much as Roger is noted, Roger Waters is noted as a bass player. As far as the Pink Floyd is concerned, it's the gong is he is as identified with the gong as the bass. Yeah, at least in my mind. So this is a track that um, has an, an opening that kind of builds some layers, some different uh, discordant uh, uh, pieces from uh, Rick and from uh, from Roger, and then finally we kind of we hear a bass line kick in, and to me it sounded it reminded me of the bass line from Let There Be More Light from the Saucer Full of Secrets album. Sure, just just maybe sure. slow down a little bit, um, and we have we have the genesis of what this bass line is, and um, it's got a very good driving beat. Nick Mason's got a good little, uh, he's he's hitting the, the rim of the snare, and he's he's keeping the, the cymbals going. It's a very uh, driving rhythm section um, to, to, to throw credits over. Um, and then uh, Rick's got a cool little thing that he does on um, on his keyboards, on his organ. He's got uh, a cool little melody line that um, sort of picks out some notes and, and has a good, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's cool to listen to. I like it. It's, uh, I agree. It is, it is a cool little piece. That, and what stands out the most to me, well, first off, more gong. <laughs> it's you got it, it. It opens with the gong and takes it to a crescendo. And uh, my guess, it was probably Nick Mason playing it, but I hope it was Roger Waters who was playing the gong in the studio when they recorded it. Be that as it may, um, it's I'm not sure exactly where the the uh, instrumental is going, where it begins. I mean, it's it has it has that gong intro part to it, and then you know, Rick is playing some cheesy organ organ in the background and it's kind of creepy it's you know it's it has a cheesy creepiness that was me evocative of the of the uh serial program dark shadows if anyone remembers that uh you know almost a gothic but a cheesy gothic uh sensibility going on but then rick uh start he starts picking out a, a melody and you know it, they're, they're kind of jazzy clip notes and he's picking up this melody as Nick or as the the rhythm section between uh, Nick Mason and Roger Waters uh, they get into this groove and the groove itself to me it's it's stand out only because I'm have been a longtime fan of what has been popularly known as kraut rock or German electronic, 
uh, hard driving, uh, motoric uh, music. You know, bands like Noi and Faust and Kraftwerk, Kraftwerk, especially Noi. I'm a big, big fan of Noi. But uh, you can definitely hear the influence. Uh, Pink Floyd in the era was touring a lot or as much as anyone in Europe as well as England. And it was evident that those, those bands and you know, producers like Connie Plank were going to the shows because you can hear this song, not this song specifically, but the, uh, the sensibility in, that, in the early kraut rock material. It's a very motoric, driving beat from the rhythm section, and that plays well as far as the opening to the film is concerned, since the opening of the film does occur, as you said, you know, on a, a rainy highway, you know, where uh, Stefan is trying to Stefan is trying to hitch a ride. Uh, do you think it's? What are your thoughts on this being the opening track for for the second side, and not being the opening since it's the opening track for the movie, not not sequencing it up front on side A? What do you think about it opening side B? I think it's uh, nothing really remarkable about it. I think it's it, it's a good it's a better to have it on side B opening than side A because as far as the the opening gong and cheesy organ, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit ostentatious. I think to open the album with it, or it would be to me, uh, because it just it kind of sets a tone. Uh, and the tone itself is, I think, a little bit more heavy-handed than, and a little bit more snappy than the movie itself really is. And for that matter, the album itself, how the album comes across, it's a little bit more uh, muscular than... I think it's a little bit too strong, really, to open up the album. Maybe if the album was an album unto itself, minus some of the throwaway tracks, uh, I could see this, as far as Pink Floyd, going big early on, because they definitely have a, a reputation for, for doing that. But you know, starting strong on an album was, was some very notable standout piece. But as far as this soundtrack album is concerned... No, it, it, I don't. I don't think it works personally as an opener on side one. I'm perfectly fine with it. Really, it's starting side B, side two, but it really could have been anywhere on the album when you think about it. Yeah, and, and looking back at the the sequencing on side A, especially versus side B, with with side A having so many more traditional songs as far as you know their lyrics that are sung. Uh, versus the instrumentals that take up most of side side B, and that maybe I'm maybe I'm thinking about too much, but uh, you know that might be a just sort of a, a tonal thing where where main theme as strong of a instrumental track as it is, it just doesn't fit in against the the uh, the songs that are written with lyrics that are on side A. Um, it does. It does a good job, I think, on side two of sort of taking us down this this route that we're about to go on for the last twenty minutes of the album. We're going to have a lot of instrumentals and a lot of uh, what you would consider more movie soundtrack uh, score songs. Um, it's a. It's. It's just. Um, I, I think it's got a good groove, like you said. It's got a good keyboard, organ, whatever Rick is playing there. A good little melody that he's picked out. Um, and I was surprised how much I liked it when I heard it um, in the movie, and I was glad it made its way onto the soundtrack album. I would like to add that uh, it also, this was apparently a piece they performed live in 1970. Uh, they didn't continue with it over time, but in 1970 uh, they were playing it. I don't know if they were opening up their shows with it, uh, but I could see them opening a show with the song. This definitely would as far as a live feel is concerned, I could see them beginning a show with this. Yeah, it's got a, it's got a little bit of a, this is this is this um, this year's Astronomy Domine or this year's Saucer Full of Secrets. This is our this is our instrumental piece that we've come up with this time around. Yeah, that's fair. Well, let's move on to uh, the next cut, which is called Abiza Bar. Uh, 
This song to me is uh, the the sister song to the Nile song, which was on side A, and it does a similar thing that the Nile song did. It kind of, it's it's a wake up call after a somewhat mellow opening track. It it flips the script, and uh, we're back with Dave and his his uh, fuzzed guitar, um, some really strong. Uh, aggressive vocals again it's um it's not as strong of a song i think as the nile song partly because it it covers a lot of the same ground musically it it feels like part two of that track so i was like okay i've already heard that but i still like it um the melody maybe is in, in the vocals is not quite as as strong as the nile song but to me these are you know the, these two songs are are essentially cut from the same cloth for me yeah, it's uh, the You Put It Best, the Nile Song Part 2. That was my f- first thought when I heard it. And in the context of the soundtrack album itself, it's the brother to uh, the one before. And it's a, uh, it, you know, it's da- David Gilmore, guitar pyrotechnics. The overdubs are fantastic. I really like the sound of this song. Um, and uh, Nick is... In my mind, he's channeling Ringo, Ringo Starr on the fills. Mm. It's it's a it's 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 an interesting song to listen to uh, in the context of the Nile song. It's not as I think as powerful. It, it doesn't hit you like a truck. This kind of hits you more like a uh, you know a midsize you know two door. <laughs> <laughs> it, it hits you like a sedan. It hits you like a sedan, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. But still, it's it's, a, it's, uh, a, it's a fun song. It's a, it's um, Pink Floyd letting their uh, letting their rock side show a little bit, and um, you know the we, we I think a lot of the things we said about the Nile song we can say about a Beza Bar because they are very similar. Um, Pink Floyd does a good job being the rock band when they want to be the rock band. Yeah, it's it's always interesting to hear David Gilmour. Uh, get really, really busy on the guitar because the guy is renowned for these very emotional licks and, and, and chord bends and note bends and doing that type of music and doing it well as well as anybody on the planet. He is uh, noted for that. But the guy could definitely rock out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, the guy can do a lot of different things on the guitar, and doing stunt guitar pyrotechnics is definitely one of them. So it's always interesting to hear the hear him go off in a different direction, and not just ooh, he's experimenting over here. More of he's gone over into this place and he's doing it really well. I mean, the guy is. An amazing talent in in that respect, and, and he seems like the kind of guy in, in interviews I've seen with him, especially in the last fifteen and twenty years. He seems like a very mellow and down to earth, and uh, a, a guy who sort of knows what he's done, but doesn't put himself or his guitar playing up on any kind of. Uh, he doesn't think of himself as guitar god David Gilmore. Um, yeah, and he comes it, across that way in his playing, where you know he can do guitar god stuff, but if it doesn't serve the song and if it doesn't serve the mood of what he's trying to accomplish with his playing, he, he knows enough to not go there and not to be flashy just for the sake of being flashy. I get the impression, uh, and who knows where his head was at or what space it was in when he was recording for this album, uh, for this soundtrack, but I get the impression that Gilmore is, is really proud of a lot of the stuff that he has done. Um, and he's also been on record of being embarrassed in the stuff with in the very early days of his contributions to Pink Floyd or, or being with Pink Floyd. He was embarrassed by a lot of the stuff then. But as time went on, I get the impression he's very, he, not proud to the point of arrogance, certainly not, because the guy, you know, a posh Cambridge boy, um, he doesn't really, he might come across as kind of reserved in that clipped Cambridge English way, but he's, as far as his musical abilities are concerned or his contributions, I think he's proud of what he's done and recognizes his influence on rock and roll, but 
it's not like he's out there. And I've really, it's pretty rare that an artist does this in any, they, there is there is a level of humility that he tries to maintain. And, you know, that's just him being human because you know, while there are dicks out there, it doesn't pay to be, it, does, it really doesn't pay in the long run to, to be a make it all about yourself. And, you know, he's, he's very uh, self-effacing, which is another English trait, uh, a common English trait, to be very self-effacing uh, when it comes to one's own abilities. But uh, as far as back to the song is concerned, uh, the guy can definitely play. And he can... And and doing pyrotechnic stunt guitar type material is one of the one of the things that David Gilmour can do. Another something else that David Gilmour is noted for for maybe not as much in later years, but Pink Floyd fans will know this is the guy really like a lot of English guitar players started out playing the blues, and that's where we're going now to the next cut on the album. Unless there's something else you'd like to say uh, about the Nile song part two. Um, how about more blues? How about more blues? And it's, it's, um, it's seem, it's a, it's a seemingly simple title, but I, I like it's, it's more blues and it's more blues. Like it's the movie more, but it's also, here's a little bit more blues because David Gilmore to continue speaking about the, the guitar playing of, of Gilmore started out his, uh, his music career as, as a blues guy. He's very keen to remind people he started off as a blues guitarist playing in blues bands. There are a number of going back to YouTube, uh, bits on YouTube here and there where Gilmore reverts to, just as a matter of kind of like doodling in the margins where he'll play a blues lick here and there. The guy played a lot of blues and it, as a lot of English guitar players were playing in the early to mid sixties and later on for that matter, you know, some you know, people like Clapton, Eric Clapton or Jeff Beck made a career playing that m- music, but uh, black American blues was a huge influence on uh, British rock or British music of the era. Gilmore was in the thick of it. He played a lot of that, and I would have to ask him, but he probably learned to play guitar playing that kind of music, you know, as far you know, picking that stuff out and figuring out how it works. And this is uh, this track is is one of the few examples that I can think of where Pink Floyd, allowed that side of them to to come through and it, it speaks to the album as a whole you know i, I think I, I used the word patchwork earlier um to describe the album because it's it's a lot of different things all put together it's a lot of different ideas and different styles stitched together you have the hard rock of ibiza bar and the nile song you've got the moody instrumentals like main theme you've got the freakouts like um uh, up the Kyber, and later on we'll talk about Quicksilver. Uh, you've got the soft acoustic, um, almost ballads uh, from side A, and then you've got more blues, which is it, it is Pink Floyd doing the blues. I mean, they're doing the blues in space. You've got the reverb and the echo and the Pink Floyd um, uh, characteristics on it, uh, but it's it's about as straightforward blues as you're going to get from Pink Floyd, and it sounds really good. I really enjoyed the the sound of the the Pink Floyd take on standard American blues. It's interesting that in my first whenever whenever I hear more blues, I'm th- I think of Jimi Hendrix's Red House, and, and that's the the structure is almost exactly the same. You could you could probably do a mashup between more blues and Red House and have something very interesting come out of it, uh, and. Red House is a Jimi Hendrix song, and they were uh, they were compatriots. They were colleagues. They yeah. played uh, on the same tours. They knew each other. Uh, they were f- certainly familiar with each other's music. And this is I'm not going to say this is David Gilmour being Jimi Hendrix because only Jimi Hendrix really could be Jimi Hendrix. 
Well, maybe Stevie Ray Vaughan, but that's a different discussion. Uh, but it's a, as far as blues is concerned, this is as much of a tribute. Hendrix is still alive when this is recorded, by the way. Mm-hmm. But it's almost a tribute or certainly a nod to, Jim, to uh, Jimi Hendrix. And um, in that respect, uh, Nick Mason, just to shift the discussion a little bit away from David Gilmore, because Nick Mason plays on it as well. Um, he's kind of being Mitch Mitchell in the process. It's it's uh, he's he's just playing a little shuffle in the background for uh, for the guitar player to do his thing on top of. Um, how it ends is very interesting, though. What did you think of how the song ends? It's uh, it's got that little um, like it, it shuts off. <laughs> Someone is it has unplugged the song, and it, yeah, it's exactly. In fact, uh, you can hear not so much to the buzz that's common with that. With, you know, when you plug in an electric guitar or unplug it, but you do hear kind of an echo going on. And probably what's going on is uh, someone either turning off an, uh, a piece of equipment or pulling a plug out of a guitar, and there's a slight little echo that goes on to the recording. And how that happened, how that occurred, is anybody's guess. Maybe they did it on purpose. But it's I can almost imagine Gilmore or someone going... Play us some blues, David. Okay, and he plays some blues, and then he gets bored with it, or decides he doesn't want to do it anymore, and he just pulls the plug out of the guitar, and they yeah. kept it at that. That I have no clue whether that's what went on, but that's what what I like to think went on in the studio. Yeah, the the idea of the you you've played the blues enough now. <laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> We have enough blues. We have enough blues. We, we we have timed we, this out specifically for the scene in the film. You are done, sir. More more blues, David. No, I don't think so. <laughs> and, and out comes the chord. Yeah, in, in um, the film, uh, this is this is played over a scene where um, you know again our our main characters have fallen in with the wrong crowd, and our uh, our our lead Stefan is is having to tend bar for the. Uh, Nazi drug lord, <laughs> and um, yeah, that that's something else to remember, kids. Don't sell drugs for Nazis. Yes, and, and he, um, he's pushing, and you don't want to work bar for him either. No, because you're because you're going to have to push uh, the narcotics under the table with your uh, while you're serving drinks. So this is a, a point in the movie where it's clear that um, our characters are in a hole that they're going to have to spend a lot of energy and thought digging themselves out of. And it serves as a good soundtrack for that kind of everyone is starting to get a little bit sad because this carefree, <laughs> drugged out life that they had planned for themselves is just not turning out how they wanted it to turn out. <laughs> yes. You think you had a rough, rough life. Yeah. My woman left me. <laughs> yeah. My life is in shambles. But, you know, there isn't a lot of blue songs specifically addressing I'm a bartender for a Nazi drug pusher, and I'm happy to sell drugs for him in this bar in Europe. <laughs> I'm, yeah. If you were ever yeah. in a situation that would give you the blues, that would be yeah, it. Yeah, that's that's one that would make, yeah, that's definitely a bluesy situation to be in. <laughs> but, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> there the, wasn't a lot of blues being written in the in the period specific to those sort of sorts of things that... Apparently, young Europeans fi- found themselves in in the in the early nineteen seventies. Well, if there at was, least as far as the movie was concerned, if there was any band out there to tackle the need for a soundtrack to getting the blues by being a Nazi drug lord's pusher, I mean, this is this is the band to go to. <laughs> but all that said, um, I think it's a it's a it's a cool piece. Not so much a standout Pink Floyd piece of music, but it's a cool little. I guess uh, note to David Gilmore and his facility, uh, uh, his ability to play guitar and to play different types of guitar. The guy could play the blues because he evidently spent a lot of time playing the blues. Yeah, and it's it's on the it's on the album because it's in the movie. Exactly, exactly. So, 
So also on the album, because it's in the movie, at least I believe it's in the movie, I honestly, I don't remember, but it's the next track, next track called Quicksilver. Um, it's discordant, it's spooky, it's an atmospheric piece, really doesn't go anywhere. There's more gong in it, so there's that. Um, this, uh, kids, is the scary part of the acid trip. Um, yeah, this is, in the film, this is where, this is the, uh, this is the drugs are bad portion of the film, where, um, their, the character's addictions are, are starting to, to manifest and take hold and influence their, their decision making and the actions that they're taking. Um, it's, it's. It, it does its job in Quicksilver does its job in scoring that kind of um, that spiral that the the characters continue to to sort of swirl down and down and down the drain um, in their in their drug use and their drug addiction. They're they're addicted to heroin at this point um, to try to kick the heroin habit. They move over to LSD to soothe the effects of trying to break their heroin addiction um it it is a sequence in the film much like the song it's it's at times it's frightening at times it's beautiful at times it's sad um but altogether it's very unmusical um it is a pastiche of sound it's a pastiche of sounds that evoke feelings not necessarily um it, it doesn't have a beat and you can't dance to it yeah, I think the, really the only thing that stands out for me for it, uh, and it really isn't much of a standout, but I really like what I, I like what Rick is doing. It, the very interesting keyboards. Uh, it's I found myself listening to it, listening to it, and wanting it to wanting it to get better or to take it to a really good place because it seemed like it was just on the edge of shifting gears and going into a really cool space but it never does it, you know, it is, has the feel of an improvised music. piece yeah very much so and the thing is with pink floyd and uh certainly uh uh rick wright is uh, these guys could improvise and as far as live music was concerned they would improvise and either circle back to a a real good place or take it to a real good place. Uh, and they never do on this cut. Of course, it's for a movie. It's not a actual performance piece to please an audience. It's really to, to color an aspect of the film. And it does that, certainly. Uh, but as far as a listening to... Oh, listening to music, nah, this is really something you listen to. It's notable in that it's something that they produced, but that's that's where it starts and that's where it ends. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. It it, it colors a, por- a portion of the film. I think that's very well said. Um, and, and it does it well, but as a piece of music that you want to return to, I think that's a lot of, a lot of the tracks on more and maybe on side two especially. Um, as pieces of soundtrack, they work. As pieces of music that you want to listen to repeatedly, not not as much as as other um, other pieces of music in their catalog for sure. Yeah, it's it's one of those cuts where it's uh, sadly it will sadly for us for some people, it's not going to be included in any greatest hits. Mm-hmm. It, it might be in the you know, in in the back of the box set somewhere, but it's not uh, it's not a collection of great dance songs. It wasn't on that album either. It wasn't. You know, they didn't collect it there. <laughs> <laughs> not that I, not that I'm aware, aware of. It, you know, actually, I've never listened to that compilation. But I know it exists, so I really don't know that it's not on there. But I would really be surprised if it is on there. It, it's not. I'd be surprised. No, it's, I, I, okay, I have that you. on. Uh, I have that on cassette tape, actually. Right. <laughs> and oh, uh, well, really? That's cool. Yeah. It's it's a <laughs> it's a strange compilation of some some later uh, era tracks. And no, Quicksilver does not appear. <laughs> right. Exactly. And 
which is, and Quicksilver sounds like a Pink Floyd song that you would have, uh, that would be more notable, I guess. And that's only because of the, 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 the way the title flows mm-hmm. uh, being said. The title itself, Quicksilver, sounds like a Pink Floyd song. Yeah. And probably a real cool one, but it's not really. It's something, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's kind it's of like... It's discordant and spooky. Yeah, it's a it's a piece that feels like something like saucer full of secrets or careful with that axe. You know, nothing. It, it's in that vein, but it never quite lifts off. Right, exactly, and 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 it never lifts off and never really goes anywhere. It's uh, it's. I think it's. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> there's there's there, there's nothing more to be said about Quicksilver well, that I, I need to say. Well, let's move on to a, a, a track that we'll maybe have tons to say uh, about, and perhaps just as much as Quicksilver, um, a Spanish piece. I think ah, it's Paris music that my soul is next, and um, it is a Spanish piece. Very much so. It's um, going back to Gilmore again, since he's the man with the guitar. It's another credit to Gilmore's ear and ability. It's a legitimate pastiche of Spanish guitar, and uh, it's notable on that level, but it's really unremarkable as a standalone. And for my money, as far as uh, flamenco-type guitar players are concerned, or or rock and roll guitarists who, who can play with a flamenco style, I really thought that uh, Pete Townsend was a uh, more accomplished in that respect, but obviously Gilmore is doing a uh, he's he's doing a send up here as opposed to legitimately employing the style as a part of his music the way Pete Townsend uh, was really famous for. Um, See, so you think you a, think Pete Townsend? I think who is the guy that would sell? The guitar, the sort of like the cheap acoustic guitars, and the lessons on infomercials was his name Esteban. Uh, may as well be. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> uh, I always think when I think flamenco guitar, I think Esteban for whatever reason. Um, this is Gilmore's first solo writing credit on a Pink Floyd album. How um, about that? How about that? <laughs> Probably he was given instruction. Hey, we need uh, we need a little piece for uh, this part of the film go come up with something real quick. And he just sort of knocked this out. And I'm, I, I can't imagine spending too long on, on a Spanish piece. Yeah, we, um, well, according to Roger, or at least I found this quote, uh, according to Roger, Roger said, quote, we were told one bit had to be coming out of a radio in a Spanish bar. So we had to do something that suggested that. In the middle of it, David tried to make the sort of speech noises you'd expect to hear. <laughs> and so that, it's David Gilmore playing guitar to sound like Spanish guitar, playing in a flamenco uh, scrubbing style, I guess you could say. There's probably a more technical term for it, but I'm not a guitarist, so I really don't know what that is. But it's Dave doing Spanish, doing Spanish guitar and then kind of making these cheesy little bar uh, quips and asides <laughs> that really you can't understand what's being said but it's it's supposed to sound like a Spanish bar and it's it almost has a Monty Python element to yes. it and uh, <laughs> yes I and was Monty Python was on TV at the time <laughs> and they were making fun of Spaniards as much as any British comedy <laughs> group was and uh, the Spaniards being long time uh, you know the the country that Britain loved to hate for centuries when my, France wasn't filling the bill one of my favorite things on the album is uh, Gilmore's um, Spanish uh, accented um, I hesitate to call them lyrics uh, spoken word um, color to this track <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm looking them up on on online real quick these are the lyrics to uh, a spanish piece pass the tequila manuel listen gringo laugh at my lisp and i kill you i think this spanish music it sets my soul on fire lovely senorita your eyes are like stars your teeth are like pearls your ruby lips (laughs) 
So yeah, the the Python influence I think is is that's that's a good um, <laughs> that's a good connection I think. There is a I'm, I'm going to go off on a, a different direction here, but it, talking about Monty Python, there's a sketch where uh, without going deep into it, there's a there's a sketch where uh, the English uh, uh, re- Elizabethan uh, courtier Sir Philip Sidney has is, uh, has su- surprised the fr- the uh, Spanish who are importing Spanish pornography uh, on, into the British Isles. And he does it as sort of a, it's, it's a Michael Palin as playing the Sir Philip Sidney as a kind of British police inspector. And it's like, you know, what's all this then? And you have these greasy little Spanish guys in Renaissance gear going, is is nothing, senor, is literature. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and there's definitely a British comedy thread of of uh, marginalizing the Spanish. And th- this is exactly what I think Gilmore and Pink Floyd when they were putting this together, I this has got to be the direction that they were going. You know, they were. I'd be really surprised if they weren't uh, uh, kind of doing a send up in a Monty Python esque kind of way because this was, you know, Python was in the air or, or, or on the air at this time when they were producing this album. Yeah, this might be the one uh, Pink Floyd comedy piece uh, if you want to look at it that way. Um, yeah. The again the, the well, patchwork nature Corporal of the album. Clegg. Yeah, maybe so. The 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 patchwork nature of the album. This is their comedy moment on on the on the on the side and on the album. It's um, it's good guitar playing. It's yes, silly it is. vocalized um, words, and uh, it it fits into the movie in a particular spot. And it's on the album because it's in the movie. Yep, it's it's notable because. It's David doing yet another guitar. Hey, I can play this way as well. Check this out, kids. And it, it, that itself is a uh, it's no, notable for David Gilmore ability. As you said, it's in the movie. It's on the album, and uh, it's a gas. It's a fun. It's a there's some funny bits to it if you listen carefully. Uh, but beyond that, it's 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 a um, it's a novelty song. Yeah, it's a bonus. Like um, party sequence was a bonus, I think. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It's it's about at that level. Um, so let's go on then to the the final track on the side, final track on the album. It has a very dramatic name. It is called Dramatic Theme. Right, because it's a dramatic movie and it had to have a dramatic theme, and uh, this is it. This is it. Um, <laughs> it's um, there's a lot of echo. Um, it's Gilmore starting to do the harmonic bend of strings he'd become famous for. Um, it uh, he apparently got a new echo box for it, and so he's kind of going a little nuts with it. And not overly to the point to where it's distracting, but it's noticeable. And uh, over time, he'd be better disciplined with with the echo. But um, it's uh, that's really all I have on it. It's just a, uh, it's you know, it's it's another little instrumental piece for the soundtrack for the movie, and nothing really remarkable otherwise. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a hair over two minutes. It's about two minutes fifteen um, of some incidental music. It's um, it reminds me. It has sort of the flavors of main theme from earlier on the side and earlier in the movie. Um, it's got that feel of main theme. If and I put this in my notes, main theme but slowed and smeared. It's kind of where the the main theme at the beginning of the film it it's got a it's got a kind of a quick rhythm to it it's got a nice groove it's got a good little rick piece to it um this is later on after the events of the film have dragged our characters through the mud um 
this is this is what the main theme sounds like on the other end of the story uh where where david's taking the lead this time around and and rick and roger are more mixed into the background i think it fits as the ending to this album in a way that it it sort of brings you to the same place that the ending of the movie brings you to um yeah where they, we've, we've kind of they, hit this rough this rough patch along the way they had to end it somewhere and i think at the time when they were packaging this thing to figure out the order of songs and there was probably not so much as a battle but a you know do we do we uh, structure this thing to follow the movie do we structure it to follow a more of a coherent presentation of pieces of music from the movie to construct in an architectural way the album itself and it kind of seems like those questions they had to have been asked but they were never really adequately answered and I think when all was said and done they really didn't give much thought to it or decided eh, it's not important it's just movie it's just music for the movie and uh, we're putting it out because we did the music for the movie and uh, so maybe we can move some units but it's really the importance of where we place songs uh, it seems to me that, that was a low priority and there really wasn't a lot to work with it's not really an album's worth of music although it is an album full of music it's not really a collection of songs uh, to put under a single title for anything other than a soundtrack because it's what it is. Yeah, I think Side A had more tracks that if if Pink Floyd were going to sit down and say, all right, let's plan out our next album, more of those songs would appear on a... I hate, hesitate to use the word proper, but I mean, let's, let's be real, like a proper planned out this is going to be our next pink floyd project versus what we get on side b which is a lot of music that you know was in the film so now it's on the album um you know that being said i, I do think having dramatic theme on the end um of side b i don't know if it was an intentional thing or not but it it for me it does serve as a good closing number i think of all the the choices maybe i don't think you want to end on a spanish piece i don't think you want to end on more blues i think having dramatic theme placed here at the end it sort of it it takes you out it 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 tells you a a little bit it, it connects with the story of the film i think a little bit by having it placed at the end of side b yeah, it, I think there's merit to what you say there, yeah. and, and in the end, I agree. It all of side B, uh, maybe not all of it, but the, the bulk of it really seems like filler. Yeah, uh, they they had music or pieces of sound, uh, pieces separate pieces that they had constructed for the film, and they had this album they had to fill out and kind of like they it's almost as if they put them in a bag and shook the bag and poured it out and the chips fell you know where they lay and uh, or they lay where they fell uh so they had the music they had to use they had the opportunity to use it for an album let's move some units as i said and that's what they did but i agree that it there would be worse songs to end this album that has a the name Pink Floyd on it. Uh, there would be worse pieces of music they could have chosen, and it works fine. It's not, you know, all in all, the album itself I don't think is really remarkable, although there are some really cool tunes on it, uh, and some that are, you know, frankly, I think they're fantastic. But... Uh, well, and I think really more, more so fantastic against what else is on the album, but not to sell them too short. I mean, there's some stuff that, you know, that is very quote unquote Pink Floyd, 
but uh, really it's in the context of the album itself there's some stuff on there that's great and in the context of Pink Floyd as a whole there's some stuff on there that's remarkable and very good but the album itself this isn't an album that I'm going to put on for to introduce Pink Floyd to somebody not in any stretch of the imagination yeah it's a good album for Pink Floyd fans to discover once they've already become Pink Floyd fans Um, right yeah when you're mining the back alleys of what's out there this is one of the little I'm not going to really call it a gem there are there's a couple of songs that are gems, certainly, but uh, the album itself is not, it's more of a, it's not a piece of coal either. No, <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's, and you say, you say filler, I agree with you, there is a lot of filler on, on the album. A, a lot of the filler, though, is, is good filler, like, it's, it's not, it's not anything that make you turn it off and go, this is terrible, but it is, yeah, it, it right. isn't just up to the standard that um and i think we i keep saying this in these early albums um the band would just become so much better at crafting songs and crafting albums that when you go back to these earlier works you can you can see and or i guess rather you could hear the little nuggets that are there and like oh this is this is a thread that they're going to pull later on to much greater success but they haven't quite worked it out yet they haven't quite gone all the as far as they're they need to go with this particular idea um and and so you get things on on this album is a good example of it you have little pieces different styles trying things out um yes it's a movie soundtrack so it's it's a it's sort of an outlier in the fact that a lot of the music is tied in with another medium that was not of their creation it was somebody else's work that they're working against or with rather but um the the filler that's there is is interesting for the most part it's not particularly noteworthy in the grand scheme of things yeah it's there are moments that stand out in terms of the pink floyd that we would come to think of when we think of pink floyd you know rick's keyboards for instance in uh in cirrus minor uh, that churchy atmospheric feel to it uh, would be one example of it. And the, the virtuosity of David Gilmour uh, being able to go in different di- directions with his guitar plan and be legitimately good at whatever direction he decided to take it in. Uh, and that's notable for this relatively early stage of the band itself. And... And they did this, I think you said, in a week or you know, uh, barely a week of uh, production on this thing that they were able to, uh, who knows how many ideas they had drifting around before they actually got into a studio that they employed on this. But to an extent, it shows how quickly they were working. and But also, likewise, it shows to an extent how quickly they were able to work and turn out not what was entirely, but m- moments of great material. You know, there's, there is definitely some great material on this album. Uh, all that said, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's not their greatest album. Yeah. Uh, certainly not at all. It, show, but it shows some, their, there's some good material on it. Yeah. It shows the potential is there. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're in, in the contemporary time of this album and you're you're on whatever train that Pink Floyd is on and you're, you're riding with them, you're, you're anxious and you're excited to hear what's next because you can hear the potential and you can hear um, you can hear the confidence growing. You can hear the the style of the band is starting to to mold itself a little bit more and uh, you're you're just a couple albums away from like all-time greatness so you're you're getting closer you're getting closer very true i think in the in the context of the times that this album was released uh the way people were hearing music in the era was mostly by radio uh buying record albums buying singles and that was it you know unless they appeared on top of the pops and 
they weren't playing anything from this album on Top of the Pops. Mm -hmm. They weren't really, really playing Top of the Pops at this time anyway. But all that being said, if you were a Pink Floyd fan of the era or just somebody who had heard of this band that was growing in popularity as they were at this time, uh, when this album came out, you may have got bought the album or maybe a friend bought it and you listened to it and you probably went, okay, well, yeah, this is, there's this movie, right. Have you seen the movie? I have, I haven't, whatever. Um, but there was definitely a broadening of the fan base. I can see that with this album or following this album. Yeah. And I think that had to do with some of the heavy rock elements, like from the Nile song, for example. Um, and also because of the different styles that the band was able to bring across. Uh, there was to the extent of, well, this, this band must be important. You know, they're doing a, a film soundtrack. You know, they're, they're not just a, a band that's playing, you know, these little theaters here and there and playing on, on college campuses. They're, you know, these guys are working in the industry. And their fan base did not explode after this, but it continued to consistently grow and, uh, and would explode not too long Within a few years after that, yeah, there's a little, this. there's a little something for everyone on this one. Um, may not be their best work in any particular style, but it does, like I said, it does showcase um, talent and potential. And uh, there's enough up to this point between Piper, Saucerful, and now this album to get you excited for for what's what's to come uh, in the future. I mean, this was a top ten album in the UK. Yeah, that's uh, and that says a lot. It, uh, you know, they were growing in popularity, and they weren't really making TV appearances or anything like that. But word of mouth was spreading, and I think that had to do with there was a there was there was a an underground, quickly becoming overground swell of popular music certainly. Uh, you know, the Beatles were just about to end things, and uh, gee, was the Pink Floyd, to, were they going to be the, the, were they going to pick up the mantle of the Beatles? Who knows? But popular music was becoming, uh, that, that's quote unquote popular music, was becoming popular and starting to become mainstream, for lack of a better way to put it. And Pink Floyd was the up and coming band. And the album sales of this album, uh, of a movie that really was not remarkable, uh, and a soundtrack album full of not really remarkable songs, except for a few notable exceptions, uh, you know, that says a lot about how the, the fandom of Pink Floyd was growing at the time. And I think it says more about the buzz in the air about Pink Floyd than it does about this album itself. And, and just to, to make one last note on that or observation, like that, that kind of underground success beginning to translate into mainstream success, um, you know, there are little hints of it by this point in their career. It's giving the band a little bit of an, of, of an opportunity to have confidence to to try some things that maybe they wouldn't have tried a year or two previous, trying to experiment with um, their song craft and their album uh, structure. The next album that we talk about definitely is is falls into that line of trying out some things that um, popular music was not uh, not ready for. <laughs> Um, and we'll talk about the next album on the next episode. But, you know, the band, grow, just growing confidence in, in being able to try things and have um, enough success to get away with, with calling some shots that maybe they wouldn't have called earlier um, in their career. Um, well, you, could, you could tell that the, uh, there was a cumulative experience going on that was they were taken into the studio. And sorry to interrupt, you were going to say? Oh, I was just going to ask you, um, you know, this, this, this time we usually go through the album and, and choose our, our favorite tracks and our least favorite tracks. So I'll, I'll let you uh, ride that wave first. Which, uh, 
which album track from the more soundtrack would you say is the best and the uh the one to cut as far as the best is concerned i think the nile song that's really uh the, the way it, it it this gets on top of you and just you know just out the gate it's it's powerful and it's really interesting to listen to Pink Floyd go heavy metal and just uh, that itself is a is surprising but it's a very very good surprise and I'm also going to say that to a lesser extent but on a a similar note Cymbeline is wonderful in that way, but the Nile song is it for me. For the for this album, it's it's the Nile song is 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 my absolute favorite. Uh, it's just uh, it's a uh, it's it's so substantial. It's it's heavy as hell, and it was done in a period where heavy music was becoming. Uh, I'm not going to say the norm, but it was starting to make serious popular inroads, and uh, with your Black Sabbaths and your Led Zeppelins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's nice to see that Pink Floyd stuck their stuck their toe in that particular pond as well, and was able to do a do a uh, do a a really nice job of it. It's really, 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 really nice. I like what they did there. Now, as far as uh, what is on the other end of the scale, um, that's a more tough one to do because there's so many little throwaway, uh, just stuff that really would never be on an actual Pink Floyd album if it wasn't for a, for a, you know, the fact that it's a soundtrack, and. Um, I guess I'm just gonna have to go with Quicksilver. It's, uh, you know, it's it's this discordant spookiness and nothing really. Uh, there's really nothing evocative about it in terms of interesting to listen to. It's, I guess, as far as my own musical abilities are concerned, is I could create Quicksilver and I could probably do it pretty quickly if I, you know. <laughs> If I had the instruments, or at least if I had the studio, it's put, putting together that type of discordance and building that mood is really not. I mean, it's it's kind of a party trick as opposed to more as opposed to being a you know an actual demonstration of talent or musicality, which it isn't. So you know, at the top of the things, Nile song. At the bottom of the things, Quicksilver. How about yourself? Well, yeah, I agree with you on the Nile song. Um, I very much like main theme. I very much like Cymbeline. But Nile theme is the one, even before I went to listen to the album again uh, this week, uh, the Nile song was one that I had memories of. Like it was, it was a standout track from the first time I listened to this album, however many years ago it was. So um, for all, and for all the same reasons, it's, it's, it's a, it's a heavy kick in the face early in the uh in the in the track order and uh it's it's a really great vocal from gilmore it's it's a heavy song that it just uh is is a great rock song and um it's it's always been a favorite of mine off this album as far as what to cut um yeah same problem as you there's a lot of filler on the album a lot of tracks that wouldn't normally be on a pink floyd album so, you know, out of the filler, I'm kind of thinking to myself, which, which filler track doesn't offer anything at all? You know, you have something like a Spanish piece that is filler, but it's fun filler. And um, Quicksilver has a little bit to it, if you've seen the film, to tie it with the visuals to make it make a little bit of sense. So I'm, I'm not quite there with you on, on Quicksilver. Um, up the Kyber has just some weirdness to it that um, there's a little bit of musicality to it to kind of keep you interested. But for me, the one that just doesn't really offer anything is Party Sequence. And I know it's a very short track and it's it's tacked onto the end of side A, but it's just percussion, 
not even necessarily performed by members of Pink Floyd. We don't know. Um, it's yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So you know, is it even really a Pink Floyd song? It's on the album, so it's on a it's a Pink Floyd song in name at least. But yeah, it it doesn't really even as filler, even as a throwaway track. There's there's nothing there to even say well at least it does this you know and for me it doesn't have that yeah i it's a, that's legitimate and i think this is more of a what the the question of what do we like and what do we cut uh that all comes down to personal taste and uh i'm thinking of it in terms of you know what is when I put the album on and this song comes on, uh, how is it making me feel or how is it, how is it working for me as opposed to how is it working for the picture itself, for the, the motion picture that it was, uh, that w- that it was added to. But, uh, that's legitimate and, uh, you know, not going to argue the points or anything like that. Um, I think those are good points to it and, um, I respect that. Um, anything else before to say about the motion picture soundtrack to the movie more? Not, not really with the exception more of... More to say on more, nothing more? <laughs> nothing more on more. I, there's one more soundtrack to come in the, in the line of albums. Um, a few, uh, a few down the road, we have another soundtrack album. Um, uh, of the two, uh, definitely more is the the rougher of the two soundtrack albums that the band put out, but we'll, we'll talk all about obscured by clouds in a much later episode that we will. And I'm looking forward to that one as well. And, uh, um, uh, that's a, that's a great album, um, in my mind, but we, we will talk about that when the time comes. Well, nothing more to be said than I will say with that, the needle goes up and we place the recording back in its sleeve Please look out for our next episode where we put on Pink Floyd's fourth album, the double LP. I'm going to call it Umaguma, although you might call it Umaguma. We'd love to hear your feedback, so leave us a comment and rate the episode. Until next time, this is Jerry. And Al. On the Vinyl Sideways Podcast. We'll see you soon and shine on. <laughs>